Good afternoon and welcome to R2A's launch of our new booklet, Criminal Manslaughter and How Not to Do It. I'm Gay Francis and also online is my business partner, Richard Robinson. So as a little bit of an introduction, um, as many of you will know, Rich and I are career risk and due diligence engineers and been working together at R2A for over 20 years. And today we're really proud to launch our new booklet, Criminal Manslaughter and How Not to Do It. The booklet outlines how directors and senior decision makers can positively demonstrate safety due diligence and thereby, if the worst should happen, avoid the possibility of a criminal manslaughter conviction. It outlines a process that boards and organisations can undertake to ensure credible critical risks are appropriately identified and managed, ensuring um, that safety due diligence is positively demonstrated. It's important to note that R2A are not consulting engineers or a consulting engineer is not a legal practice. Um, and whilst we've regularly tested our approach and understanding with very many lawyers in Australia and New Zealand, the presentation does not constitute legal advice. And therefore we suggest that before adopting the approach described, you should first confirm it with your own legal counsel. Um, for the launch, we're going to place the booklet in its overall societal context and explain how R2A came to this understanding. We'll finish up with some speculative examples of what it might mean into the future. We don't cover these aspects in particular in the booklet as it's primarily focused on the obligations of the WH legislation and the explanation of how directors can satisfy what has now become a categorical imperative required by all Australian New Zealand parliaments. So as usual, Richard's going to do the presentation. I'll monitor the chat box and we'll have a chat at the end on Q&As. Thanks everyone for joining us. Ah, uh, that means I'm at the start now, Gay. Okay. Um, well, what I was, as Gay said, what we're basically doing, we're sort of doing an overview of what, what this thing actually means and where it might go to in the future. So I'm only going to cover the actual contents of the book in a, in a fairly straightforward manner, in the sense that it really is quite a practical handbook. It sort of explains, as the contents here show, there's a bit of an introduction sort of explaining what due diligence is, the fact it's a legal concept and so forth and how it works. Um, there's a timeline of criminal manslaughter and how we got there, from sort of starting from King Henry II's consolidation of the common law um, through uh, Lord Atkins, Donoghue versus Stevenson, um, and then uh, Maxwell QC's review of the OHS Act in Victoria, and introducing so far as reasonably practicable, flowing on to uh, what was then uh, Deputy Prime Minister Julia Gillard and the Workplace Relations Minister's Council, um, and then to the WHS legislation that's passed um, with some criminal provisions in Queensland and ACT and then into the criminal manslaughter provisions that we now have in Queensland, Victoria and most likely in Western Australia on the 1st of July 2022. Um, it then summarises the core elements of the legislation. Um, that's what, what chapter two is, it's more or less the facts. Um, three sort of makes the distinction between risk management and due diligence and how due diligence actually requires other things to be done as opposed to, for example, what ISO 31000, the risk management standard, calls up, and that's what a lot of people have been doing. Um, chapter four basically describes the tools and techniques, um, what's best for what purpose out there, um, the seven risk management paradigms and the three sign-off systems that you see, experts, the inquisitorial approach and the adversarial approach. Um, and then chapter five is actually the process, which I'll skim through briefly here. Um, and are then supported by a number of case studies, things that have actually been done in different industries and sectors. Um, and there's a sort of a last chapter or a last section on COVID um, and how you might go about managing that. Uh, just to make the point of how we got there, well, basically we, we, we did it as experts witnesses over about a 30-year period. Um, this is, these are not things you chase because you sort of don't really enjoy doing these things. Um, just to give you some examples, the first one here is a young Chinese guy, the only son of a Chinese family that got his neck caught between a, a steel staunch and a forklift, um, and uh, that killed him. Uh, the second one, um, the press, somebody lost their hand in a press and of, of, of Italian descent, and an uncle turned up with a young fellow who'd lost his hand, um, and that was fairly complicated. The third one is um, trying to establish why two kids were electrocuted in the Northwest Cape in Western Australia. Uh, this little bob in here is part of the reason. Anything that kills two kids, um, you really do sort of wonder why we managed to get ourselves in that situation. 
And the last one was the Bushfire Power Line Safety Task Force, which both Guy and I were expert risk management members on. Well, that was 173 people died in the Victorian and the Victorian government obviously was fairly unhappy about the whole thing. So we sort of looked at this from the point of view of what, why did these things happen? And if that was the case, what does it all mean? And it's probably fair to say that we were sort of adopting the common law um, due diligence approach um, well before the WHS legislation ever came into, into play. Um, this means we spent a lot of time with lawyers. Now, when you deal with lawyers, um, they do come in different types. Um, uh, th there's those who know the law and just tell you about the law, and there's those that have a somewhat more a wider view of things. Um, for example, just on the matter of the law and so forth, I mean, if you write an expert witness report, the barristers aren't meant to actually um, sort of affect or tamper with what an expert witness thinks. Um, but if a barrister's on the phone and says, you know, paragraph five of your report, did you mean... And they explain what they think that paragraph, what they what they thought that paragraph might have meant, and then you sort of say, ah, well, I didn't say it that well, did I? Perhaps I should clarify that paragraph. The lawyers are very clever about these things, um, and they're not all created equal, as I just sort of mentioned. Um, now, this is interesting because the the lawyer whom we've sort of discovered has the most. Well, the best explanation of all this is a fellow called David Howth, the professor of law and public policy from Cambridge. He produced a book, Law as Engineering, which we were sufficiently impressed with that we asked him and sponsored him to come to Melbourne a couple of years ago, together with the Victorian Bar Association. Uh, but basically what he's saying is that all the big US and UK law firms, and he does make the point that, um, and the lawyers, a lot of lawyers are doing this sort of thing, he does make the point that, that, that they've been doing this for some time, is that the lawyers are really um, social engineers. If somebody's got a problem, they want to do something. Um, the, the, the way the law, these lawyers now go about it is to say, well, what, what are the options? And in the circumstances, which is the best thing to do? We find it strange because we were sort of aware of this sort of policy process and the difference between the lawyers some time ago. Now, there was a lawyer we used to deal with who was a New Zealand-born and trained uh, Kiwi lawyer, uh, Ding Wai Chan, um, and he made a couple of points that we, we actually regularly refer to in our office. There's one called the, the Ting Principle, um, and that is say what you mean, mean what you say, and say nothing else, which we've found to be a very useful piece of advice for the last 30 or so years. And the other point he made, which I've again quoted, he sort of said exactly what David Howell was saying. He said, look, there's two types of lawyers out there, the ones that give you legal advice on the law, and those are sort of saying, well, what are you trying to do? And, yeah, there might be a better way to do it. He said, think about your options. Um, he was obviously always in favour of the, the latter. Um just for the record, last time I looked him up, he was the general. He was the managing director of Hutchinson Telecom in Hong Kong, um, which I last time I looked at was about a five billion dollar turnover company. So, says some interesting things. Now, um, the, the point we're trying to make here is this little book is representing is it's actually the implementation of a quite a complicated idea, and it represents the alignment of moral philosophy, legal philosophy, and engineering philosophy. Um, I just this diagram pops up in a little book. Um, you've probably seen it before, but it sort of represents the point made by John Howard in 2017 when he was talking about what's the point of politics and the way our parliamentary debates are supposed to work. And the point he makes is that politics, above everything else, is supposed to be a contest of ideas, not a public relations exercise. Um, and the idea is that in the case of implementing the WHS legislation, for example, there were long and extended arguments in Parliament about how these things should be. But it had been the holy grail of all of both sides of politics for a very long time that having different OHS laws in different states obviously caused confusion for companies that worked inter interstate. Um, and it was a holy grail that, that, you know, we should get harmonised legislation. This was important for the well-being of Australia as a whole. Um, and the game question became, well, how do we get there and how do we make this happen and, and all those sorts of things. Um, and that's what I've always understood to be the contest of ideas. I do have to point out, it does seem passing strange that our current Prime Minister has basically gained his skills, as, as far as I'm aware, as a public relations person. Uh, and that just may reflect the, the, the case that politics, like the courts, um, it's not what is the case that counts. It's what the court, and in the case of politics, the public think the case that counts. Um, just one of those more interesting things. Now, just to sort of basically recapitulate where we're at, um, I mean, when the WHS legislation came in, two uh, jurisdictions of Queensland and, and ACT, if I recall correctly, 
um, used to have some criminal provisions um, and they were to do with recklessness. That means you, you had a known hazard and you were made to let it happen. Um, the Dreamworld case is the one that, where the, the raft flipped and the four young people got killed. Um, they knew that the raft could flip. And I, we're just reading the press reports here. They knew the raft could flip um, when the water levels were low. And so they, they, the precaution they adopted was to tell the operator to keep the water levels up. Um, and the operator apparently could be a, a student on doing a summer job. Um, they didn't sort of say, look, we could put an interlock on the thing so that if the water drops, the, you know, the conveyor and the, the ride stops. Um, that's a sort of the reckless issue. What actually happened was, um, particularly after the Dreamwell incident, um, Queensland decided that, no, it's a little bit more than just that aspect. We actually want to go a little bit further. And what they did was they adopted the other aspect of negligence in the common law, and that is it's not just the reckless part, knew or made or let it happen. You also have to consider things that ought to have been known. And that's a much tougher test. So not only is it what you did know and failed to do, it's now what you ought to have done and therefore failed to do. And that's where that workplace manslaughter has come in. And what's most extraordinary about it is that the, the sort of thing they're talking about is the $16.5 million in the, in the previous WHS legislation for just the recklessness. It was only five years. And now it's up to 25 years in jail for officers. Mind you, it's on a beyond reasonable doubt basis, but still it's astonishing. The other point to notice, which is the, the reason why R2A sort of can write the book, is that the test is based on existing common law principles. Now, so far as I know, it's the case in all jurisdictions, um, whether it be Queensland or Victoria, whichever states, that the report that generated the, the need to include criminal manslaughter basically has asked everybody to do it. So one would imagine that's going to occur, even though presently it looks like there's only three jurisdictions that, that this will actually be the case. Now, one of the points you need to make, which the, the text makes a pretty obvious thing about, um, a lot of people think you're going to throw every hazard you've got into the due diligence basket, and that's not actually the case. Um, and this is actually quite important because it reduces the scape and scope and scale of what you have to deal with. Um, pretty much, uh, I mean, the courts and our parliaments and the whole philosophy of this thing was driven by the kill and main outcomes. Um, you know, if somebody thumps the thumb or the hammer, that never goes to court. And people will stop that after a while. So if you just look at a sort of a typical risk register for most businesses, the ones you're actually fretting about are the critical ones, the ones that can kill a maim, because they're the only ones that ever go to court. And they're, therefore, the only ones you actually positively demonstrate safety due diligence for. There's no particular reason why you can't leave all the rest of them to the organisation somewhere else. And the point of that is that if you're only looking at 10% of all hazards, the actual amount of work you've got to do to demonstrate safety due diligence is, is substantially reduced. Now, obviously, you've got to be clear that you, you haven't missed any and you have got all the right ones. Um, but it actually does reduce the amount of work that you've got to do. Uh, what's completely fascinating about this, and I did not think this would happen in our lifetimes, at the highest level, this whole thing adopts the, the, the golden rule, do unto others. And again, the Christian tradition, it's love your neighbour as you would love yourself. Uh, it's particularly articulated in the snail in the bottle case, um, in the UK in 1932 by the, the Brisbane-born English law lord, Lord Atkin. Now, I'll just take you through this point because once you understand what actually happened, it is actually something that everybody pretty much wants to get on the side with, that the golden rule basically is in anything I've ever read in any place to do with any major philosophy in Plato or, or Christianity or Zoroasterism or Confucianism or Taoism or any other the sort of major philosophies and ideas of doing things. The golden rule of some form is in these things here. Sometimes it's the double negative don't do unto others so you would, wouldn't do unto yourself, but, but basically it's a similar sort of thing. So this was the case, um, Donahue versus Stevenson from 1932 with all the English law lords in there. Looks a bit strange from where we are. And this is Lord Atkin of Aberdavy, a uh, dapper little man on the left-hand side you see over there. And I'll just quote him because this is the thing that pops up everywhere, the rule that you are to love your neighbour becomes in law you must not injure your neighbour. And the lawyer's question, who is my neighbour, receives a restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee will be likely to injure your neighbour. Who then in law is my neighbour? The answer seems to be persons who are so close and directly affected by my act that I ought reason to have them in contemplation as so being affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called into questions. Now, the, the lawyers are having a wonderful time with this and it's been... You know, it's been one of those major cases, and I didn't realise I was looking something up that the 
the, the, the Brisbane law courts have actually gone and stuck a plaque to the effect. You can see it down there in Tank Street because that's where the federal courts in Brisbane are. And that's, it was in Tank Street that he was actually born. And confusing enough, he used to refer to, despite the fact he was born in Brisbane, which was in Queensland, was the state of Queensland at the time, um, he was actually Lloyd Atkin of Aberdeby, which is in Wales. And so he used to refer to himself as a New South Welshman, which I think confused everybody, no doubt, quite satisfyingly. Um, uh, one of the lawyers who I used to give some presentations with who helped draft the WHS legislation was a guy called Barry, Barry Sheriff. Um, I really put this slide up just to sort of point out what happens when you give a lawyer access to a drafting package. Uh, but the point of the slide is it's trying to make it clear that we're all in this together. There's no doubt that there's, you, everybody's this, – this act is universal in its application. It goes anywhere in Australian law, and now it's been passed in New Zealand's HSWA Act in 2015 – it goes anywhere Australian or Zealand law extends, which is actually quite a long way. Basically, what it's done is the common law used to have due diligence as defence against negligence. There used to be two primary defences against negligence, no power defence. You can't be held accountable for something which you have no control, of which you have no control. And the other thing is you did have some control or full control or control in some way, then you could demonstrate due diligence to, to demonstrate um, that you've done every reasonable practical thing you could to make sure this thing didn't happen. Um, the courts are quite clear about this. It's not the fact that something happened that counts. Um, the courts understand bad things can happen despite the fact that have been diligent. What they object to is, that, is, is when there's something that could have been done, if it had been done, would have stopped it going wrong. And so what's actually happened is um, this diagram here, which, which again is in the book, you know, people used to do compliance order to satisfy statute law and regulations, and then people used to have expert investigation which did recognise good practice, and they needed due diligence reviews, which is what R2A was doing for a long time, to a common law duty of care. Um, but what's actually happened is that purple arrow has popped in, and what they've basically done is taken what was the common law duty of care in all its aspects. It was initially just recklessness, you were made to let it happen, but now they've also included ought to have known, which was the other aspect of the common law, and they've basically stuck it into statute law. Now, there is obviously a difference between the two. Common law is done on the balance of probability and statute law is done on a beyond reasonable doubt basis, which is quite a profound test um, and much harder and tougher, obviously. But that's sort of the philosophical sort of shift that they did. What that actually means and what we've actually done is turned it into a categorical imperative along the lines of Immanuel Kant's theory of life. Um, that is, our parliaments and judges seem to have decided that due diligence is universal in its application. It creates a moral justification for that action. And that also means the converse, that failure to act demands sanction against the failed decision maker, particularly that ought to have known clause. Um, it's quite interesting because I have no idea whether uh, Atkin was reading um, Kant at the time. Um, he was sort of pretty well known, and, but some of his reading some of his stuff can be pretty hard work. Um, but Kant always never thought that the golden rule was a categorical comparative, and the reason was because it depended on how you define neighbour. Um, one of the examples that people usually use is, is Queen Victoria. She only considered other royalty to be, na be neighbours. Now, if you only consider other royalty to be neighbour, you can have a war as long as you don't hurt any of the um, other royalty. Well, then you haven't damaged your neighbours. Tough on everybody else. Um, and it does seem to me that uh, Atkin, when he sort of said, you know, what is a neighbour? Well, he sort of gets around Kant's objection to a categorical imperative, which is actually a fascinating thing to do. Well, some of us are probably less fascinated than others, I suspect. But anyway, but what it actually means is that what we've actually done is made, made safety a design imperative. Because, and it actually means that the, the lawyers and the engineers have suddenly aligned in a way that I simply did not anticipate could happen, and to support the categorical imperative now imposed by our parliaments. Now, that's a fairly extraordinary thing to have done. What it means is it's basically saying there are four steps and all the lawyers in the UK and the US and Ting Wai Chan are saying it. You basically articulate, well, what's the problem? What's the issue? What are the alternatives? And in the circumstances, what's the best to do? Let's do that. That's a fairly simple idea, although it's articulated in a fairly complicated legislative framework, and it's flowed into rail safety national law and marine safety national law, and it's just moving everywhere. I mean, you, you have to understand in Victoria, for example, the SOFAR principle, uh, which is the core, the core uh, element of the WHS legislation, 
which says, you know, if you eliminate hazards so far as reasonably practical, and if you can't eliminate, you shall reduce them so far as reasonably practical. That's also flowed into our environmental legislation now. Um, and I suspect that if Victoria's adopted that, it's likely to flow into other jurisdictions too. So apart from the due diligence obligations on directors to be able to pay their bills when they fall due and those sorts of things, it's now just about flowed into everything. Safety, it's quite extraordinary. Now, what, what we thought we might do is just go, well, if you, if you understand this high-level understanding, what, what, where, where does this going to take you? What does it actually mean? Because uh, I suspect there's going to be some unintended consequences associated with this. Um, and so we've got a couple of examples here just to sort of give you the, the flavour of what the parliaments have imposed on themselves, which is one of the reasons why people are normally fairly careful about this in the past. I'll just take you through three examples here. The, for the first two, I'll just describe, and the third one we've got some pictures for. But just take dam safety, for example. There's a hell of a rumpus going out there at the moment in the in the large dam community where because the, the ANCOL guidelines refer to ALAP, which I won't go into now, previous things we've talked about and so far. But the so far principle of dam safety, if you apply the principle of reciprocity, if you live downstream of a large dam, if you live downstream of Warragamba Dam in, in New South Wales, and that dam breaks, okay, it's going to be a serious problem. Um, all the big dams, uh, if they break, are going to be a serious problem. Now, obviously, you'd expect that dam to, because dams give great benefits. Um, you know, without Warragamba Dam, certainly wouldn't have water, so it's a big benefit. Um, uh, but, but they do create high consequence, low likelihood events, um, you would expect the dam to be built and designed and operated to all recognise good standards. But there are other things that you can do. For example, um, when we're doing some work, and it's described in the book on the lapstone cutting um, for the railways and rocks falling on the track, which might derail trains, um, we discovered that um, Queensland University has a spin-off company called Ground Probe. Um, it's, it's a form of radar which was designed for open cut mines and what it was aimed to do is to you aim it at the open cut mine cutting is to make and it, it, what it does is monitor that cutting and if it moves at all in a millimetre or centimetre it goes off um, we recommended that for that project about 10 years ago and when I last time I looked at Grandpa about 6 months ago they'd, they'd moved into 30 countries they've got 300 people working for them and, and according to the website the technology's never failed to, to not notice ground movement well you could possibly enhance the dam, particularly if it's a, a, a hard surface dam as opposed to obviously an embankment with grass and trees on and things like that. But if it's a hard surface like an open cut mine and you had a ground probe ray bar aiming, aiming at it, you get 24 hour surveillance, which would tell you if anything ever started to happen. Now, the, the, the principle of reciprocity says, well, and it's not just what the standards call up. If more could be done and it was reasonable in the circumstances, why wouldn't you do so? And if you're living downstream with you and yours, and the horror of a dam break occurred, and the fact that it had been monitored by ground probe would have saved the day, uh, you would be cranky, and society would be cranky. And so why wouldn't it, why wouldn't it be done? Now, I have no knowledge of whether dam safety people have gone and tested ground probe, but now that we've mentioned it, it becomes sort of public knowledge, you'd hope that they would do so. So that sort of rolls into the electrical safety option we've got there. You're probably well aware that the, the bane of all electrical regulators is the home handyman getting into the roof space and fiddling with the roof wires. It drives them to absolute desperation. And you see all the ads they have on the thing, don't do it. Um, well, from a design point of view, um, electrocution roof space is the problem. It's a known hazard. Could you eliminate it? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, you can. 12-volt um, LED lights would get rid of the problem. And in a new house, the new technology is power over Ethernet. Um, Ethernet wiring will deliver about 25 watts at 48 volts, which is extra low voltage wiring. Now, and, and that's industrial capacity light fittings. Um, so what industri new industry is doing now is they're building their warehouses with, with uh, power over internet cables going to each light fitting, which happens to mean the light fitting smart and reports its presence and how well it's going. And the light's gone out and all sorts of good things. But you could wire up a house like that too. What that basically means is under this legislation, if somebody gets killed in a house that was built since the WHS legislation commenced or the OHS, legis OHS legislation of Victoria since 2004 or 2015 in New Zealand, um, and somebody gets killed, an ex of kin would have a right to potentially ask or, or, or have the, the designer, the builder, the electrician, anybody who installed it say, well, why wasn't it built with low voltage wiring in the roof? and all the 240-volt power in the walls. It's entirely doable, as it can be eliminated. And it wouldn't cost you any more for a new, new one. It would cost them all be more difficult, obviously, for retrofitting, but in a new building, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, that sort of breeds onto a much more massive one, 
um, which would be global warming uh, under this legislation, um, it would sort of, the serious question has to be asked if they're serious about it and you believe in global warming, Victoria probably should be considering whether it should cool the planet because it's got the resources to do so. All of big four Australian states would have the resources to do it. That's an interesting one because it does, it leads onto the concept of neighbours and whether you can define neighbours into the future. Well, yes, the High Court of Australia has had a look at this at some court case um, in uh, Hawkins versus Clayton. And the High Court's noted a duty of care can be owed to a class of persons who are not yet born. So that would be neighbours in the future. Now, if you look at it like that, um, roughly speaking, that's where Jane and I are at the bottom end down there. And We've had an ice age in the last 10,000 years, so now that's just making the point is the climate changes a lot. Uh, and I don't know whether global warming is just natural or it's uh, human-induced or actually it's a combination of both. My personal suspicion, it may well be a combination of both, but I've got no clue. That's just from the CSRO from the last century, basically, in Australia. Uh, and uh, this is from Melbourne Water. Um, they're fretting about what a, a um, 0.8 metre sea level rise would be which is one of the lower outcomes of global warming. You can see the pink areas there, the bits they're fretting about. Well, that includes a bit of Melbourne City. Um, if you reckon the Greenland ice sheet could possibly melt, that's seven metres of water. Uh, if that's 0.8 metres goes pink, what do you reckon seven metres would do to Melbourne? It'd be something quite substantial. Uh, if you just look around at the options that are available to you, I'll just pick three because you can. Um, Space-based sun shields um, has been put up by um, NASA a while back. Uh, they reckon somewhere between 20 billion to 5 trillion would do it. Um, you basically put the sun-based space shields at the Lagrangian L1 point. Um, is my mouse showing up on the screens? Okay. Well, you can see the L1 point there between Earth and the sun. The L5 and L4 points, I think that's where uh, Bezos is planning and putting his um, human habitats rather than going to Mars as an option. Uh, I have to point out that that, that cost was five, 20 billion to five trillion using technology that NASA had in 2015. If um, Musk actually gets himself off the ground with his new space shuttle, I reckon he'll do it for 10 billion. Um, this one here is quite interesting because you can see that the University of Bristol, Cambridge, Oxford and Edinburgh, so the Scots and the English are starting to work together again, which is mystery, mystifying at some level. Um, they've been promoting this idea for the last 10 years or so. Uh, basically, you increase earth shine by increasing the albedo effect, i.e. you create more clouds and the white shiny bits reflect more energy away from the earth. Um, it's a technology that seems to be quite well established and it seems to be eminently viable. You do that by sticking a blimp up in the air and pumping high pressure water into the air, which just create more clouds. The one that's probably most convenient for the Victorians and which the Queenslanders probably have the greatest interest in in terms of protecting the barrier reef is this... Um, Fertilisation options. Um, every year, apparently, you get these big welling, upwellings of water around uh, the Weddell, Weddell Gear and the Ross Sea Gear. Um, that, those nutrients create algae, those algae create krill, and then the whales turn up and get fat on the krill. Um, apparently, you can do a similar sort of trick and create an artificial gear uh, by fertilising the Southern Ocean, which would create giant algal blooms. Um, some of the krill would eat that, but some of the... Um, some of it would drop out and it would just be a carbon sink and some of the krill would die and that would be a carbon sink and we'd probably have a lot of fat whales around as a result. Um, so you want to be careful what you're actually doing. But 22 kilotons of iron sulphate, somewhere between 10 million and 100 million, according to one thing, but there's a general view that it would probably work. Um, Victoria spent um, $5.7 billion on a desal plant and it's going to cost us $18 billion by the time it's paid off. Cost us $1.8 million a day. We haven't actually used it for any material value. The reason for having it is a criticality driven argument, very much following the philosophies of, of, the, of the legislation. Um, possibly won't go into that now in any great detail. Um, but the point I'm making is that for Victoria to spend $18 billion on, on something that it thought was a critical risk, even though it's perhaps considered to be unlikely, if it's critical and it can be stopped, then governments seriously consider these things. And an $18 billion spend, well, any of the big four states, Western Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, or Queensland could spend that amount of money. Brings you to the question, of all the options, global warming is definitely an issue, whether it's natural or human activity, I don't know, or a combination of both, but it does seem to be occurring. And you, we are experiencing uh, sea level rise. I think we're up to about 0.2 
metres from where we were about 100 years ago. Um, what are the options that are available to you? Well, there's a nice little threat barrier diagram to describe it to you. Uh, one of them, you could use greenhouse gas emissions, but that only works on, on the human one if, if that's the cause. If that's not the only cause, it won't be that effective. Here's the greenhouse gas sinks, iron fertilisation, which not only cools the planet, it also gets the um, carbonic acid out of the ocean, and that means it protects the uh, um, uh, brief, brief drilling um, building creatures and so forth. Here's the space-based sunshades, and here's the deliberately induced atmospheric particulates in Hans Hirschhorn that the Cambridge used guys are keen on. Um, here's your loss of control point. There are some things that could happen. I mean, Krakatoa or Taupo or um, the big volcano in, in the US could go off. Well, that would cool the planet. Or you could actually chuck some resilience measures in, which sort of acts pretty late in the day, but you can do it. But you can see it does need to raise the point. Um, if Victoria's got the resource to do it, and if they truly thought that we could get three or four metre rise, should the Victorian part of the series to consider um, cooling the planet? Um, you'd want to think it through very carefully, and there's some international treaty obligations that might actually affect the federal government and so forth, but this is the logical consequence set of this kind of a philosophy of adopting the golden rule as a categorical imperative and imposing it on all your parliaments and legislatures. Um, it is a fairly extraordinary thing to do. Now, what will finally happen? Um, I have no idea. Um, but it's certainly a, an interesting possibility that I don't really think has been properly thought through, which leads us to the questions. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes for questions. If anyone's got any, happy to answer them in the chat function. So we do have one from Graham. How does the change of ought to know into statute change employer obligations? If now beyond reasonable doubt, I gather this means that an employer or owner of a hazard must demonstrate actions to be a higher level. Um, perhaps I can give you a sort of simple example of the simplest way. Um, one of the things that used to generate a bit of work for people like us is that um, people get a, a, a young graduate engineer on the job and they're trying to work out what to do with them. So what they do is they send them out to go and do a hazard survey. And said bright young graduate engineer drops an A4 spreadsheet list of problems into the, the, the boss's in tray. Now, up until that point, the boss didn't, didn't actually necessarily know about those hazards. But once they've been dropped into the in tray, the boss now knows beyond reasonable doubt that they exist. So that's where the recklessness part comes up. So if the, if the boss failed to do anything about it and one of those hazards manifested itself and somebody got killed, well, then it would be fairly easy to show they'd been reckless. They had a known problem which they failed to deal with. But prior to that young engineer doing that, it was a, a thing that ought to have been known and it was very difficult on a statutory basis to get somebody on that. They could be got on a common law basis for which you can buy insurance, but on a statutory basis, on a criminal basis for which you can't buy insurance, the, 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 the boss would not have known about it. And so, therefore, it wouldn't be in principle impossible to actually get them on that in that sense. So, by including the ought to have known, it not only says, yeah, it's things you knew about but didn't do anything about it, it's saying, right, you ought to have known about it. And that test is a, it's a complicated test um, legally, um, and it just adds that much extra to the duty of the, in this case, the boss. Okay, any other questions? I did just post something in the chat function a bit too early, so apologies for that. Um, there's no other questions at the moment, but Rich and I are okay to stay for a, for a couple more minutes. So thank you for um, joining us today for our book launch. Rich and I would like to thank past and current associates for their inputs into the various ideas contained in the text, as well as our reviewers who kindly reviewed the draft. Of course, we're responsible for any errors that remain and any typos. Um, we'd also like to thank Megan from Joella Marketing for the cover design and Terry at Melbourne Print Group for the printing. Um, if this has been of interest to you and you'd like to learn more, we're offering a booklet at a discounted rate of $45 today, um, and including postage anywhere in Australia. And I've added the details in the chat box, but pressed return a little bit too early. Um, these will all also be sent through with the recording. Um, sorry. Just before we, I'll just check the chat box again because there's a little bit of a time delay. Um, so do you think insurance companies will exploit the criminal framing? One of the questions from Tim. They don't have a choice. If, if you're convicted of a criminal matter, the insurance company can't cover you. It's, you. You may not buy insurance for criminal matters. That's the rule. 
and I'm not sure if you know this one off the top of your head, Richard, what specific sections of the legislation resulted in the addition of or to have known? Uh, no, I don't, but we do refer it into the, in the booklet. I can probably look it up, actually. Um, Josh, maybe we can take that one offline and shoot you an email on that. All right. Um, also, if this has been of interest, we also deliver a half-day um, criminal manslaughter course through Engineering Education Australia. Um, these are still being delivered online um, due to COVID restrictions, but we are hoping to get back face-to-face -face very soon. But we've got a final one scheduled for the 11th of November this year. So that sort of wraps up our book launch. Thank you again for um, joining us. Um, we appreciate your support on these things and um, have a great afternoon.